Welcome to the Song Saloon. Each episode, I meet with an artist and we sit down with one of their songs. Today, I'm meeting with the artist Ships Have Sailed. Ships Have Sailed is the brainchild of vocalist guitarist Will Carpenter. The Ships Have Sailed sound has evolved into sincere indie rock with an unabashed pop structure. After sharing it with fellow musicians, Carpenter recruited a lineup that now permanently includes drummer Art Andranikin. Carpenter describes the band's moniker not as a pessimistic reference to the renowned idiom that ship has sailed, but instead a fresh, positive perspective on the unexpected outcomes of unforeseen circumstances. Welcome, Will. Yeah, nice to see you, Jordan. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's great to have you on the show. Tell us a little bit about the song you're bringing today. Yeah, so the song that we're going to hear is called Someday. And it's an oldie but a goodie. It is the title track off of our debut EP, uh, which was released almost 10 years ago at this point. And the original EP, what I will say about that is that as many first records are, it's a little rough around the edges in areas, but it's one of those things and Someday specifically is one of those songs where it stood up to time and it's still one that very regularly makes it into our live sets. I love playing it. The meaning of the song has grown over the years for me personally. I figured this was going to be a good one to dig into for all of those reasons and probably more that we'll uncover in this conversation. Wonderful. And the reason we're covering this song in particular right now is because you have a live album that you're releasing where this was featured as a new version. Can you talk about that process too? The live album actually kind of happened by accident. We were releasing a studio album called Ages. We released that last year. And because of the pandemic and just various circumstances, we hadn't done a live show for a really long time. And we do have kind of like a, a fan base that's kind of dispersed. They're all over the place. We have fans in the UK and Europe and Canada. And I wanted to do something special for everybody. I asked a friend of mine, Dan, who had just moved to Ojai and just built a studio up there, full name Dan Satan, in case anybody wants to look him up. His studio is called Rad Sounds, R-A-D-D. I basically asked him if he'd be interested in helping me to produce a high quality live stream show. So in the process of doing that, we, of course, wanted to feature mostly songs off of the new record because it was going to be an album release show. But as we were going through and making the set list, we really also wanted it to flow like a live show, like something that we would play if we were playing a local show here in L.A. or out on tour. And so a couple of rather early songs made their way into that set list, even though it was very much focused on our album Ages and the songs on that. And Someday just happened to be one of those songs because it very much is still congruent with the themes on Ages, and it is really fun to play live. It has some great energy that way. So yeah, it made it onto the live record. The reason the live album is actually being released is just because we kind of surprised ourselves with how well produced this live stream show was. And I was listening to the mixes and I was just like, it wouldn't take too much to get studio like quality. And so over the holidays this past year, I dug into those, like I cracked open the mixes, gave them the attention that I feel like they needed in order to be released as a live record. And here we are. It was all kind of an accident, honestly. Yeah, this live version has some really cool choices with the instrumentation and how the mix sounds versus the 2013 version. Thank you so much. I love that you said that. The live interpretations of the songs, like they are the same songs, but they do have a different character and energy to them. And we did make different decisions as far as like, not necessarily arrangements, but instrumentation, I think is a good detail for you to have pulled out. Thanks. Let's go ahead and go to the clip, just a little bit of the song, and then we'll play the whole thing at the end of the episode. Cool. Skin as all the branches rattle 
Thinking that it's one big battle Life feels like a sin Gazing in Through a lifetime of conflicted chatter Heart and soul all bruised and battered Where can we begin? Cause it feels like I'm living someone else's life And I think I've forgiven those who cause me strife And I know someday we'll be gone But someday my belong Awesome. I'd love to hear more about the process of making this live album. I'm a little bit OCD and I really like to do things at a high level and a good quality. We weren't 100% confident that we could actually pull it off, which makes the fact that it turned out so great even more amazing and just like helps me to appreciate that looking back. So Dan and I did some virtual planning. We would get on a call or a Zoom or something, and we'd kind of like talk about the set list, how long we wanted the show to be, how many songs. We did that first, and then we started talking about like the arrangements and how we would conceive of getting together. He's up in Ojai, which for those of you who may not be familiar with California, is easily an hour and a half of a drive from LA, but depending on traffic, it can be more. So it's not like we could just pop over and do rehearsals. Art and I got together a couple times at a local rehearsal studio to just knock the dust off because we ourselves hadn't played together for a while, but we were bringing in new musicians as well. So the way we planned it, we planned like three days of setup and rehearsal at Dan's studio in Ojai, and then one day of show. So we basically captured and recorded the show, gave it a quick mix, and then we broadcast the recording. Getting to Dan's studio the first day to set up, like, I just remember Dan and I being really overwhelmed. Of course, like, we're all friends too, so it was fun, and it's like the exciting type of overwhelm. But we were definitely like, I don't know if three days is going to be enough. And we have video people showing up on the day of the shoot. So it's happening. So the first day we actually got set up done in time to do one run through of the set. So we started off strong. And then the next two days of rehearsal, we dialed in the vibe in the room of us as four individuals. It felt really, really good to play music with human beings again shoot day we were ambitious but we were relaxed and the energy i feel like came through in the performances and in a way how all of us were feeling in those moments has a lot to do with how special the record turned out right and you mentioned art in the lineup when did art join the picture i want to say art joined the picture in 2015 that's pretty early on He's been a part of the project for a really long time. We were playing with a session drummer largely, and we had landed this showcase at Canadian Music Week in Toronto, and it unfortunately conflicted with another of this guy's projects, and so he couldn't make it happen. I asked around, and my friend Dan, different Dan, was playing bass with Ships of Sailed, and he mentioned this guy Art. And he had a really long last name. Yeah, I don't know if I said it right. Andranikian? Andranikian. Andranikian. Not even close. <laughs> no, actually, that's a really good effort. I think he would give you an A for effort. So he had a really long last name, but Dan was like, if he's available, he's a quick study. He's got a great vibe for the project, and I think you should talk to him. So I gave him a call. It was a pretty tight schedule, actually. I think we had two rehearsals and then we had to go. And this trip, we took a Spirit Airline red eye flight from Los Angeles to Cleveland. I think enough said. Then we rented a van in Cleveland. We drove across the Canadian border. We got hassled at the Canadian border because, so Art is Armenian. 
and his parents to take him back to Armenia when he was little. They got him this old Soviet passport, which he still has. And Dan was like, oh, bring that because I want to see it. Yeah, shouldn't have brought that. It kind of raised a red flag at the border. But we had a great time. We like all shared one hotel room. We walked all around Toronto, which is where Canadian Music Week is, and ate some really great poutine. Our showcase wound up being at the exact same time as Death Cab for Cuties. If you're at a festival, all the showcases are free. Are you going to go see Ships of Sailed who you've never heard of before? Or are you going to go see Death Cab for Cutie? But we did have like 25 people there, which I took as a win. And there was great energy in that room. Like people started a dance party for one of our songs. Everybody was super friendly. We sold some merch. We made some new fans. And it was a great time. But I often kind of reminisce with art about that experience. If that had been me, and if that was like my first experience with a new project, I might have just been like, Wow, why the Spirit Air Red Eye? Why the drive from Cleveland? Why this? Why that? But he just kind of like rolled with it all. We all got along and it was really, really fun. And so pretty soon after that, he just kind of naturally became the first guy I would call when we had a date that came up. Then we were recording some new music and I asked him if he wanted to be on the recording. It kind of all just happened naturally. He's like family. He and his family are like, an extension of my family and we hang out like his kids give me side eye and like get all sarcastic about me taking their dad away and it's good times with good people that's great so let's go back a few years before when we recorded this song for the first time this is your first ep how did you get those songs together why did you choose those songs in particular i just love to get in your headspace for 2013 ships have sailed so it really has a lot to do with the formation of the project itself. So these six songs that wound up being our first EP, or I guess at that point, my first EP, because it wasn't really a band back then. It was just a group of songs that really weren't a fit for my project that was kind of like the main one at the time. I'm going to be careful because it's a delicate story, I suppose, but that project had a very specific genre bend to it. It was like a rock hip hop fusion, but think like early Kanye meets Foster the People as opposed to Linkin Park. So a little bit more like alt leaning on both the rock and the hip hop side. It was a really cool project and it had a lot of potential. We were signed to Red One's record label and big things were happening. But it was a six person band with two front men and a lot of interpersonal dynamics, not all of which were like positive. And when money started coming in, it became clear that the logistics were not balanced the way they needed to be in order for the project to sustain itself. Some of us tried to have that conversation and kind of look long term and see how we could adjust. And others were just like, well, no, we're happy with the status quo for reasons that I probably don't have to explain. And so all of that energy that had been going into that project started to feel like, I don't want to say a waste because our journeys are what get us here, right? So I was kind of like, these six songs are special and they don't fit with that project. And I'd started demoing them out. All of this other stuff was happening on the side of the other project and it was starting to circle the drain. There were a lot of very complicated emotions because of that fact. And I would say a lot of that wove itself specifically into the song Someday, which was a work in progress. It was a verse that really wouldn't leave me alone. I feel like the experience of that band breaking up and getting so close to really big success, I think, and not quite getting there, really informed my forward-looking musical philosophy, my songwriting, the necessity for me to hone my own production and mixing skills over the years, and also the branding of Ships Have Sailed. You mentioned at the top that ships have sailed is an agnostic turn on the phrase that ship has sailed, which is a negative backwards looking 
missed opportunity thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas ships have sailed, it's kind of like, yeah, maybe you thought that was a missed opportunity, but here we are. Without the missed opportunities, you wouldn't be somewhere else. Without falling flat on your face, you wouldn't know to be careful what you're stepping on. So it was really kind of this very personal and emotional experience that kind of led me to start this project and collect those songs and write a couple new ones and release it as an EP. And people just kind of started reacting to it. When I released the first single, I didn't put any PR behind it. There was no playlisting. Social media was still pretty organic back then. The algorithms were way less invasive. And the next thing I knew, indie radio stations were picking it up just kind of randomly. And I got like the first couple fans that I actually noticed that I like got messages from were from over in the UK and up in Canada. And I was like, okay, there's something here. I'm going to try to put together a band. You know, it has been almost 10 years, which seems like a long time, but I also think that progression has been really important. Like these days, I'm very confident in my production and my mixing and my songwriting abilities, whereas back then I was very tentative and I certainly wasn't as good of a producer. And now I'm doing all of that as a co-writer and producer and a mix engineer, not only for my own project, but for other people's projects as well. And it's been just like a really oftentimes hard and frustrating, but a really beautiful and incredible journey. I don't think I've ever quite put that into words before, but like I'm very appreciative of those 10 years. It's not like, oh, I wish I were further. I wish this or that. I think with something like music and creativity, it is about the journey. And I'm actually quite happy with where I am, even though we all dream of stadiums and like whatever. I kind of feel like once you get there too, if that's like your goal, you might find that those stadiums are, I don't want to say emptier because stadiums can be full, but like the goals are empty if the heart isn't there. You know what I mean? So the fact that I still have the heart and I'm still raising the bar and writing from my soul in a place that's real and feels authentic to me, that's a beautiful thing. The goals are kind of secondary, right? When you hit goals, it can feel really great. But when goals are your guiding star, inevitably they disappoint you whenever you hit them. Exactly. And the whole Canadian Music Week thing, it's a good example because like, if we were staking the success of that trip on like how many people showed up to our showcase, we would have been heartbroken. But we also met a lot of really cool people. We saw a really cool city. We had a great experience. The showcase was actually great. Like, we played well. The people who were there really enjoyed what they saw and heard. And to this day, some of them still keep in touch. That's incredible. And then there's a whole conference around it that you meet industry folks. You can go to other showcases, meet other artists. And, like, it's about the whole experience. If you can't appreciate that, I feel it's like a little bit of tunnel vision. If you had gone into that show being like, wow, I got scheduled at the same time as Death Cab, really? And just had a bad attitude the whole time you're performing and didn't give it your all, then you wouldn't have gotten those fans and you wouldn't have had that great time. I think your point is spot on and something that I hope a lot of people can glean and take into their own lives because it's about the process. It is about the process. And I also feel like if you're performing only because there's some sort of critical mass there, if you're pursuing all of this for like external purposes, you're probably in the wrong place because even being able to make a decent living as an artist is like winning the lottery, let alone the whole like millionaire dream. It's like the chances of that are so, so slim. And there's much easier ways that are perfectly honorable and probably fun to make a better living. Right. So if you're doing all of this for like the idea of glory or financial gain, like, damn, rethink. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. It's taken me a while to be like this Zen about it. I feel like that's pretty common for creative folks to come to that realization. Some people quit. Some people come back to it after they quit. 
And for me, anytime I think about quitting and how much easier it would be like to just not spend all this time and energy and like lose sleep and burn the candle at both ends. Well, usually that's when an undeniable song pops into my head <laughs> and it won't leave me alone. And I'm just like, well, I just can't imagine myself not breathing life into these things when they insist. Yep. I would also like to talk to you about how you balance things in your life with music. How do you balance your work with other artists and your own projects? Yeah, that's a great question. That is a constantly moving target and it kind of works itself out. I work in parallel really well. So like I could have a writing session with another artist and write a song and be working on my own stuff two hours after that. I shift pretty easily between projects as an artist or a creator, like it just helps to also know how to juggle. Right. What effect has being so involved in production had on your songwriting? Because a lot of the songwriters that we've had on the show so far are not producers as well. Usually they're just songwriters. So because you do both so well, I wanted to take the opportunity to ask you, what does production do for your songwriting? I guess my answer would be, I try not to get my producer ears to get in the way of songwriting. Like sometimes a song will give me an idea about the production. And sometimes if I'm working with somebody else, sometimes I'll mention that while we're writing. But I don't think that production should ever inform writing. I think that writing should inform the production. And the song really should be able to stand on its own without the bells and whistles. The elements of the song should be able to stand on their own. And then you bring in the production and you elevate all of that. Cool. So you would say you try to keep that pretty separate. So you're writing, you're not thinking, oh, I would really love this to get like a huge anthem rock. Like this would be great in a stadium. You kind of take that part away as you're writing. Certainly there are songs that just have that energy and mm -hmm. it's undeniable. So like, I'm not saying like you fight against the energy of the song, but I don't deliberately go into the studio and be like, I'm going to write the next sports anthem today. You know what I mean? The way I like to create is from somewhere real. If I'm creating deliberately from scratch, like, for example, if an artist and I have a writing session that's scheduled, I'll just start with a conversation. Like, mm -hmm. what's going on in your world? How have you been feeling? What did you notice on the street when you were walking to get your coffee this morning? Like random stuff. Songs are about us and they're about people and the world and the human condition. And we all have a lot more in common than the way our world currently feels, at least the past several years. There's this illusion that we're drifting apart. But I do think that's an illusion. I think that we have as human beings so much in common a conversation can uncover like those micro commonalities of things that are working themselves through your system in any given day or week or hour. Something will kind of like vibrate in those conversations that will turn into a song. I've almost never had an unfruitful songwriting session where it starts with an honest, real person to person conversation about thoughts, feelings, like what's going on in life. If folks are open enough to have those conversations, then we're in a good spot to like create something together. What's your process like writing on your own? Do you have a schedule? I don't schedule solo writing time. I would say the closest thing to that is I do gratitude journaling. I think that's a really positive habit. But for my own songs, Ideas pop into my head out of nowhere, and I just pull at those threads. That's it. A lot of times, an entire song will weave itself out of thin air in like five minutes. It's weird, and it's a little bit unnerving at times. And then other times, it'll be like a chorus, and the verses will elude me for a while. There's this song that I wrote recently. The idea for it has been just sitting around in my brain for years. 
is a very unique situation. I was given a prompt by a music supervisor who wanted something very specific for a scene in a movie she was working on. And this little fragment of an idea popped into my head as she was describing like it was a very complicated multiple character situation with a lot of different dynamics. I took it as an opportunity to write with somebody that I'd never written with before and who I'd wanted to for a while. We didn't particularly use the storyline in the session. We just kind of let the song do its thing, but it lent itself to that scene beautifully and it really turned into a special song. And literally the idea had just been a fragment in my mind. Maybe I wrote it down in like a voice memo or in a note somewhere, but like it's just been there for years. There's never like one method that I find works every single time. You just have to lean into whatever energy is there and roll with it. Yeah. It sounds like you make a lot of time and space for co-writes. Why do you do that? And how has that been a benefit to your art? I like creating with other people. I think there's a synergy when you create something with another human being or with a group of human beings that, you know, sometimes it can be there when you're dealing with your own chemistry, but there's like a magic. It helps me to break out of my own patterns, my own habits. It brings something new to the equation every single time even if you're writing with the same person. So yeah, I do make a lot of space for that. And even when I have an idea on my own, a lot of times I will bring in a co-writer to just see where we can tweak, strengthen what is already there. What I've noticed with co-writing and writing in general is I can get stuck working on the same thing over and over when I'm writing by myself. We had this experience recently with the song that I brought in and I'd written it months before and just hadn't gone anywhere with it like there was just something that wasn't quite connecting and it was nice because in our co-write we were able to work out all those kinks and get it rolling once it's a co-writing situation the process becomes a lot more fun it's like a puzzle it's nice to do a puzzle with a friend they're sitting across the table they're seeing it from completely the opposite perspective they're going to find different pieces than you are because of the different perspective and the combination of that can be a really, really powerful thing, which I think 100% was the case with our writing session. And that song turned out beautiful, by the way. Thanks. I'm super stoked on it, too. And yeah, for me personally, I don't super love puzzles and doing them by myself. So really <laughs> looking in that situation, it's like, are you really doing it for the puzzle or for the connection with the other person? It's really about the connection with other people, and it's great when good songs come out of it. Yeah, 100%. There is a special type of magic that happens with a collaboration. Yeah. I think that's a great theme for this episode, co-writing. I think people are very scared to make that leap into co-writing, and that can be scary. I haven't had many negative co-writing experiences, but I've had less optimal ones. Definitely, and that's going to happen for sure try to make the most of it. Usually, I would say I also try to give folks a second chance. Everybody has an off day. And then sometimes, honestly, the synergy isn't there. Or people have very different ideas of business practices. That can be a big vibe killer mm. in our field. So you just kind of have to feel that out and just expect that some relationships are going to work out and develop into strong partnerships and then others aren't. Just be okay with that. Learn from every single situation. That's great. Thank you. So before the end of this episode, I want to recap some of the things that are coming out for Ships of Sailed. So we have this live album that's coming out, which will play the track someday from this live album at the end of the episode. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about the project? Yeah, so the live album is really the big thing right now. It'll be available on all the digital places, but it will also be available as a video, like a downloadable video mm -hmm. on our website. So you can own the entire like performance in addition to being able to enjoy it in its audio form online. 
There is lots of other stuff going on behind the scenes that is very exciting. So I will just say, join us on social media at Ships Have Sailed Everywhere and keep in touch. You can sign up for our email list as well, which is great at beating the algorithms that run our lives. There's definitely going to be more going on this year. On a personal level, my wife and I are welcoming our first child into the world, probably towards the end of this month. But yeah, there's lots of musical things happening too. So it's going to be a really exciting year. Yeah, huge life changes and musical happenings. So very excited to see what's going on with your project. Thank you. And you know, I'm keeping my eye on you as well. I know there's big things coming for you this year too. Yeah, I hope to get our song out soon. I'm in the process of figuring out all the pieces for that. So that'll be really cool. I love hearing it and I can't wait to hear more. Well, thanks so much for being with us today, Will. Yeah, thanks for the invite, Jordan. This has been a really, really fun conversation. Yeah, thanks so much. All right, I'll see ya. Okay, see ya. Thanks for stopping by the Song Saloon. Episodes are released weekly on Wednesday, and you can follow on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter at The Song Saloon. And visit our website, thesongsaloon.com, where you can find past episodes, transcriptions, sign up to our email list, and find more ways to support the show. Please follow, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Every little bit helps grow our community of artists, songwriters, and music lovers. We truly couldn't do it without you. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Cause it feels like I'm living 
someone else's life.